So hello everybody, um, I'm Sadie Mills, as, as just introduced, um, from NIWA, um, and my co-authors on this talk and this piece of work um, are Brent Wood, who um, probably some of you may, may know and is currently presenting in the other talk in the Thorndon Room. Um, so he was going to be here to answer any particularly technical questions, so if you have any of those, please go and hit him up afterwards. Um, and Jane Robbins works in our software development team at NIWA and is a SQL whiz who helped out um, to develop the tool that I'm going to talk to you about today. So for those of you that may be from out of town or out of the country and don't know what NIWA is, it's the National Institute for Water and Atmospheric Research. Um, we are a Crown Research Institute and um, we maintain um, nationally important databases there and, um, and science assets and, and where I work in particular, a biological collection. Um, and the area of the science that NIWA does that um, I work on in particular is enhancing the stewardship of New Zealand's diversity, um, freshwater and marine, uh, through the freshwater and marine ecosystems. And the program that I work on particularly is also the marine biological resources. Um, so we deliver fundamental knowledge about the diversity and distribution of marine biota in New Zealand and in the um, waters that we look after in the Antarctic, in the Ross Sea, and also in the wider Southwest Pacific. Um, and so, yes, we're all in Wellington. Um, we've got a little office at um, Greta Point. And um, I'm actually the collection manager of the Niwa Invertebrate Collection. So that's what this little picture is um, up here um, of our shelving. Um, so I'm going to go over the collections that we look after, um, the database we use, specify, the GIS solution we wanted, and what we found and how that works and some outputs to show you. So... The Niwa Invertebrate Collection, I'm the collection manager of that facility. Um, we're funded by the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment um, as a nationally significant collection. And we look after about 300,000 jars of preserved marine invertebrates. So it's kind of like a library of dead things, just to really simplify it. Um, so there's, um, we have specimens, as I said, from New Zealand, from the Ross Sea, and from, uh, from the wider Southwest Pacific as well. We cover 8,500 8 species from 21 phyla, so that's the big groups. Um, and we have um, about 142,000 registered in our database, so we have quite a long way to go to catalogue everything. Um, the collection began in the 1950s with the New Zealand Oceanographic Institute. And we're growing, we're still collecting out there today um, on biodiversity and fisheries research, but we're, that's um, probably more minimal than it was in the, in the old days. Um, but we also receive really great samples from scientific observers on commercial fishing vessels. We also house the Marine Invasive Taxonomic Collection, which has 74,000 samples, um, and also some, ne some data um, for the Niwa Algae Collection, which is housed at Te Papa. So... Um, we manage all of this in Specify, which is open source software um, developed by the University of Kansas. It's for natural history collections. It's an amazing tool for managing um, uh, natural history data. Um, the Specify software recently lost their NSF uh, funding, so um, we're now in a consortium and we can decide if we want to pay a, a membership to get some support. Otherwise, you can download and use it for free. It's used in 38 countries and supports over 450 collections. And believe me, the people that are not using this in their collections are jealous that they don't have this. So it's really useful. Um, it's a suite of applications that um, access the data managed in the underlying MySQL database. So MySQL does support spatial data types like lines and polygons and points, but Specify doesn't actually use those. Um, we store our lats and long as an X and Y um, coordinate um, in, in the bottom box there so we can store our station data and we also have um, data for taxonomies so the names of the different animals um, in the database as well. So they've got an inbuilt plugin for Google Earth so we can just quickly visualize our data collection points on the map um, which is really useful we, but we can only drag and drop record sets from one query of data as a, as a standard user. Um, so we can just query one taxon level, file them to species, um, we can pro plot the data from one cruise or the data inside one square box, bounding box of lats and longs. So it's quite useful but it's not 
completely useful for everything we want to do. So we get multiple requests for our data from a whole range of people wanting to use it for their research and of, often from multiple different polygons um, and areas that they want the data from. So we would usually export the data um, into an Excel file, for example, to send off. That has problems um, because those exports are made at different times. The data is out of date. We need to replace and update them. And if we've done some grooming afterwards, that's not captured in the original database. And also we can only export 20,000 records at a time, which is a bit of a problem when we have a lot more than that. And not everything lives inside a single square box. This map is showing the polygons um, where there's vent, vent activity. So that's where there's an undersea volcano or seamount and um, uh, up the Kermadec Arc north of New Zealand. So an ideal solution for us is something that accesses our database directly. Something we can go right into the live database. We can have real-time validation of our points that we're entering in. Um, make sure that they're not plotting in the middle of land, uh, for example. Um, and we want to be able to produce publication quality maps and compare quickly the distributions and integrate with all sorts of other map layers to make the maps pretty. So we did find that through using QGIS. Um, it's a really powerful tool for us. Um, and we also use the GDAL, the Geospatial Data Extra Abstraction Library Spatial Data Access Software. Um, to make a virtual data source um, to present our non-spatial data sources as spatial data. So that uses a short file to describe the source of the data and present it to a spatial um, software data set to another program, um, which in our case is QGIS. So describing the data source, um, it looks at what kind of data we have, and in our case it's a MySQL database. It talks about where to get the data from. Um, what the SQL is to get the data out of the database, the type of geometry data that we want, and in our case it's a point, the columns that have the X and Y, which is the latitude and longitude start, um, and how to create the geometry and a coordinate reference system for our part of the world. Um, so when it uses the file, um, it points at the external data rather than saving all of our data in a file so it's really light and it makes it live and it can be opened as a layer and you can use that in QGIS um, like any other layer. So um, this piece of um, uh, this file, um, just go through quickly and point out the various parts. So this is what the layer name will be called in QGIS. There's our database details. You can also use it with a Postgres database or an Excel file. Um, the columns that we want out of our database are listed there. And then how, how we're going to turn that into a spatial point and the spatial reference system. So I've got a little... Um, run through video, which I'm hoping is going to work here. Is it going to run by itself? Technical difficulties. One second. Oh, it's not going to show. <laughs> oh, OK. OK. Yep. So excuse me, and I will just open this up. So basically what I was going to show you here is how we bring, bring the, um, the file in. We just basically open it as a vector layer. So um, we can get the various layers of data um, that we want to plot on our map. Um, we've got the um, bathymetry layers. They're coming from, from the NIWA website. You can download those. Um, and just a simple outline of the New Zealand coast um, for, um, from LINs from the coordinates um, is downloaded in there. And if we were watching the video, it would show you um, where I'm loading in the, the file as a vector layer and it plots all of our points up on the screen. Okay. Um, and that's what the points look like and they're coming in live directly from our database. So it's really powerful for us. We can already see um, where, where there might be something wrong. Um, what I also showed in the video was um, the points were, some of them are on land. We do have a few freshwater points, but um, sometimes it's really helpful to, for us to be able to check that out live. Um, you can also bring in um, other layers, other shape files that you can lay on the top. Um, it, you won't be able to see it because it's in the little video. Um, so we've got benthic 
benthic protected areas that are around New Zealand, and so we can use that to put plot in the um, where the dots are falling inside those layers. And I also went in and showed the vent polygons again to show you um, those data points on there. Um, so this is just a zoomed in version onto a couple of seamounts. Um, basically showing the at the top right hand corner there, if you can just make it out, um, I've started to do some analysis inside um, QGIS where I've um, highlighted different taxon names, um, different animal species names um, with different colors and then I can already start to analyze um, the data inside QGIS. So it's a really powerful tool. Um, and then looking again um, with these, I was going to show you the tool that I use a lot, which is um, under the vector menu, there's geoprocessing tools, and there's a tool called intersection. And what that does um, is it will just pull out um, all of the points that fall inside the polygons, and um, all of those points will then be merged into a new layer, which is called intersection. Um, and that that maybe I have a shot of that. No, I don't have a shot of that. Um, but just give you the idea, um, this one here, I've put, used the benthic protected area polygons to put the points in and only give me the points that fall inside a polygon. And then I can use that to export the data um, into a separate um, file, which has only got those points in those polygons. So we're going from what previously I could only get as a square inside a square box to something inside lots of different square boxes or squiggly round boxes. Um, and, and then I can pull the data out directly in there. Um, we can also use QGIS to do um, different projections. So Brent uh, wrote me a polar projection so we can have New Zealand at the top. Um, it's a a little bit different way of looking at, at things. Um, and then down to the Ross Sea, which is the area that we look after. Um, and then you can just see this is all of the database points in our database plotted on, on, that, on that projection. And we can produce these really great um, publication quality maps directly in QGIS. Um, and you can add in heap, lots of layers and, and labels and things like that as well to illustrate what you want to show and scale bars and that's just come straight out of, of QGIS. So this has is, is really given us the ideal solution. Um, it get, we have direct access into our database. Um, we get real-time validation when we enter data, which is great if you're not sure where your where points are plotting. We can com quickly compare and um, view different taxon distributions. Um, there's a lot more control over the style, and um, if you wanted to, you could put in a, like an institutional style or, um, that you would set up for different maps. Um, and we can easily bring in other types of um, layers and data sets that give new points and lines and polygons to make the data more meaningful. And we can change projections. We can use um, produce publication quality maps, which is great. And we can ideally do all of this using free and open source tools. And so this, this can work for your data too. As I said, you can bring it in from any database you're using or from even an Excel file. Um, and um, yeah, I hope you give it a go. And so, um, yeah, if you have any technical questions, you can um, talk to Brent about those. But um, if, otherwise, if there's anything else I can answer, I can do that. And I'm sorry, I might have gone quite short because my videos didn't go. <laughs> yeah. Not a problem. Thank you very much. <laughs> do we have any questions? Hi there. Um, I was just wondering. Uh, I'm a little bit curious about your the data. Was um, there was a whole range of dots that went out from sort of the Kaikoura coast? Yep. Um, in a couple of your slides, I was wondering whether you could just talk to maybe why that is, or um, what's sort of interesting about those. So the um, the big clump there in the middle, um, that's the Chatham Rise. So um, the Chatham Rise is a is a really big fishing area. So as I said, a lot of our data comes from fisheries trawl survey or from commercial fishing vessels. So um, somewhere like that, the Chatham Rise is a really um, uh, productive area. So there's lots of currents that run over there. It's very um, productive. So there's lots of food, and so um, there's lots of fish that can be caught there. Um, so a lot of those points will be um, from bycatch from fisheries. Um, and also because it is such a big fishery area that we want to do research there to make sure that we're informed about what, what lives there in the different habitat types. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And that's that's kind of what you can see from all of the points there. There, the sort of the interesting bits of the seafloor. So going running up north from New Zealand, we've got the Kermadec Trench and the Kermadec Arc. Actually, the trench has comparatively very few dots. Um, it goes down to 10 kilometres deep at the deepest part. And so there's a lot of um, researchers interested in that, but it's really hard to get there. So, yeah, the easier to get to places have more dots. <laughs> And also, if we made the point size smaller and more realistic to what actually the point size was, you would, it would be a lot of white space on that map as well. <laughs> yeah. Was there some more questions? Hi, I was just curious about specify here, since yep. something I knew. Um, you said natural history database. Do you mean that it's primarily based around um, a taxonomic yes. um, classification? Yeah. Yeah, so you can have um, a, taxon a taxonomic tree um, in the background in, in one of the tables um, that it can, so you can import that in from somewhere like Worms if you wanted to, um, or you could build your own taxonomy of whatever you wanted to. We also have a storage taxonomic tree and a geography tree as well um, that sort of runs, that feed into different tables in the database. But it's been built. Um, it was built by Kansas University for their natural history collection. So a lot of the tables and fields that are sort of come out of the box are um, tailored towards natural history collection management. But you could you could adapt it to other things as well. Yeah, yeah, it's really customizable fields in there. <laughs>